fun, practical and tough, the Adventure Tourers are the true go-anywhere warriors of the bike industry. If you do long distances or head off the beaten track, then these are the bikes for you. Don't forget, you can get the latest motorbike reviews by subscribing right here on Visor Down's YouTube channel. Moto Guzzi brings a wealth of character to the adventure market with its V85 TT. Best for cruising out over the weekends, the V85 TT also has some tricks up its sleeve when it going gets tough. Either way, you'll look good doing it. Hi there folks, it's Toad Hancocks here with VisorDown.com and we are in stunning Sardinia for the launch of Motor Guzzi's new V85 TT. Just to talk about the two bikes that we've ridden today before I go into any of the specific details, there's this bike which you can see here which has got the two-tone paint and there's also a grey bike that we've been riding. Uh, this bike is 11099 um, and it comes with the uh, red frame, the two-tone paintwork and also the um, Michelin Anarchy uh, off, sort of semi-road, semi-off-road tyres. The grey bike that you saw me riding earlier on uh, comes with more road-biased uh, Metzler Torrance tyres. So, first things first, let's talk about the engine. So we've got an 80 horsepower, 80 newton metre V-twin. Obviously it's a motor guzzi, so it's, uh, one, it's uh, mounted across the frame. It's a push rod engine, and it's only got two valves a cylinder. Now that all sounds like quite archaic technology but it's something that that Motor Guzzi really know and it's all that Motor Guzzi have, have done for a long time so they, they know what they're doing I mean this is it may sound low-tech but inside it's got titanium rods uh, it's got roller tappets so it's quite a high-tech bike and the thing that surprised me with the engine is how on tick over when you rev it it sounds quite docile but when you're out on the road and you get it in the sweet sweet spot sort of between four and a half and about 8,000 rpm the engine really comes alive and it's really tractable and it's got plenty of torque although it does kind of fizzle out after about 8,000 so you just need to make sure that you're keeping, keeping track of what, what gear you're in. Um, on to the handling of the bike. Now, I probably say this on every bike launch that I've ever been on but these are some of the best roads that I've ever ridden and these really are. It's absolutely stunning here. We've ridden uh, up the side of a mountain, hairpin after hairpin after hairpin and there have been really long, really fast stretches of road. And this just doesn't handle like it looks. It looks like it should be wallowing and, uh, you know, f pushing wide in corners, but it's really, really nice to ride. We've been scraping the hell out of the foot pegs all day. And one of the things it could do with a little bit more ground clearance in that department. But it is such a good bike to go thrashing down a, a, a B road on. And it's the biggest surprise, because I mean, it's 236 kilograms, I think getting on for 240 kilograms when it's fully fueled up. So you get on it and you don't think it's gonna handle that well. It's not wallowy. The suspension's really plush. Up front, we've got 41 millimeter shocks, which have got rebound and compression damping adjustability. You've got a good quality rear shock absorber. You can upgrade for an Olin's. I don't really think that you'd need to because that is more than up to the job and you've got the same adjustability there. Um, Stability is great, front end is absolutely rock solid when you're hauling it down from above motorway speeds and it's just a brilliant package. It's well designed, it's well built and it just works and that's the best, that's the biggest compliment that I can pay this bike. I just mentioned the front end stability so may as well just move on to the braking system. Uh, up front we've got twin discs obviously, we've got four pop Brembo calipers. Um, they're not the top spec Brembo's, they're not the highest specification that they do, but like everything else on this bike, it doesn't really need that level of, of high tech, of high spec performance. 
These are more than adequate and they're perfectly up for the job. You've got loads of feel in the lever. They're not even radial calipers. They are adjustable levers, but they're not radial calipers, but you get loads and loads of feedback from the lever, plenty of power, um, only really feeling the ABS cut in when you absolutely hammer it or if the road surface um, is a little bit dusty or a little bit uneven. Again, like everything on this bike, it's designed, executed and done well and it just works perfectly. Just going to talk about the equipment that's on this bike. While some of the uh, componentry in the engine may sound archaic and old, what you've got up front in the terms of this TFT dash is absolutely bang up to date. First and foremost, it's one of the nicer TST, TFT dashes that I've seen. It's really easy to ride and it's not just white on black or black on white. It's actually got shades of blue and red and orange in there as well. And it makes it really easy to pick out all of the information, which is clear, it's, it's, it's where you need it. It hasn't got too many of those tricky little things where you can flip the dash and change the dials, which I don't really get into anyway. I think it's a bit of a waste of time. It's just, it's just well done, clearly laid out, and it all works. So with the TFT dash, this bike has inherited um, part of Piaggio who own Motocuzzi. They've got a system, uh, turn by turn navigation, which we've seen on some bikes like the MP3. Um, this gets it, but it gets it in a much bigger way. Um, basically, you can download an app on your phone um, and you type in your destination on your phone. And once the, bike's, the phone is hooked up to the bike that's got the Bluetooth module fitted to it, um, you set your route, click go, and all of the turns, junctions, distance to the next turn and the turn after that will be shown on the dash in front of you. So it takes up the whole dash, so you then can't see your revs, your speed, your fuel or anything but you can flick from one display to the other using the right-hand switch cube over there. So again, it's, it's a really intuitive system. It's very easy to use. And if you don't have to take a big bulky sat-nav and you've got your mobile phone with you, it's a perfect answer to that, that question of how do I know where I'm going. Um, the other options that you can get with the, um, with the Bluetooth connectivity is that if you hook it up to your phone, you can actually answer and um, cancel or reject calls if you've got sort of a Cena Bluetooth headset or an interphone uh, fitted to your helmet. Uh, you can also flick through the audio on your, on your MP3 player and change the track. So it's a pretty cool system. And, and the fact that it's all integrated and you don't need to buy another anything else to go with it to get it to work, I think is, is, is great. Um, while we're talking about equipment, it is a, a, a semi off-road, semi on-road bike. So it has got riding modes, it's got rain, road and off-road so rain is maximum abs uh, progressive thr throttle map uh, road is uh, lower level abs and the full throttle map so what you ask for you will get and then the off-road mode which we had a little play about on some dirt earlier on which i think you might be looking at now uh, which uh, turns the abs off to the back wheel and takes the traction control almost all of the way out um, and that was really good fun to slide the bike around on the dirt if you want to you can go into the menus and uh, take out the traction control and the ABS separately as well if you're feeling a little bit crazy. So first and foremost, uh, things that I really like about this bike. First, I like the styling. I know some of you out there won't, but I think it looks great. I like the retro sort of feel of the bike. Um, and I think it's just a really well packaged and well designed machine. The paintwork's fantastic and all the decals just look really, really, it's bang on trend uh, if, if you kind of know where I'm coming from. Um, I really like the character of the engine. I've not ridden a Moto Guzzi before, so having the, the V-twin mounted across the frame that, that way, it was, it was a new experience to me, and it was one that I can't wait to sort of come back to and, and ride another Moto Guzzi a bit further down the line. Um, another thing, the final thing that I really, really like about the bike is the handling and the way that it surprised me with how good it was and how genuinely enjoyable it is to ride and to throw it around. Um, the only thing that I don't like about the bike is it's only got, it hasn't got a user configurable rider mode. So it hasn't got like a user mode where you can pick bits of road, bits of rain and bits of off-road, but you can do it all in the menus anyway. So really I'm, I'm nitpicking. So there we go. To sum it up, my verdict on this bike is that it is really in a class of its own. You think of other midway adventure off-road bikes and you've got things like the Triumph Tiger 800. Uh, you've got Ducati's new 950 Multistrada but they don't do the retro thing as well as this does. The Triumph Tiger is probably better off-road than this, but this is probably better on-road. And the Multistrada is better on-road than this, but this is better off-road. So actually, when you look at it like that, this is probably the best mix of all of those things in one, and I think I love it. You read the full review on visordown.com. 
down to the shops, cruising across Europe, or maybe entering a Dakar rally. The new Yamaha Tenere 700 offers an impressive skill set of abilities. It's useful as an everyday runner, as a hardcore off-roader, plus of course everything in between. Right, we've waited a long time for this bike. Uh, something like three or four years ago, it's, the idea was muted and it came along in the shape of a prototype called the T7. Uh, and I don't know, enthusiasm for it then got people involved in actually making it happen. And here we are in 2019 with the production bike. Now I've had the very good fortune to ride it for about 350 miles, both on and off road. Just down the road from Barcelona, about an hour or so southwest of Barcelona. I've asked it to do a lot of different things and it's just come up trumps each and every time. This is an adventure bike that works off road. It's not a pseudo adventure bike that just looks the part but starts to feel too heavy, too ungainly and too, too poorly suspended once you take it off road. This thing works. Now the surprising thing is, we were led to believe that it was an off road focus bike and it would work in that environment, but I thought that would come at the cost of being poor on road. But in the first ride to the first trails that we tried, it, it was immediately apparent that this is a very comfortable, easy going, civilized bike offering a lot of protection that you could, I could have ridden it home back to the UK from that point and expected to get the, in the most civilized and sophisticated fashion. Now that was a surprise. This really is a truly versatile motorcycle and there is one really, virtuous thing about it above all others and there's plenty to choose from it's the fact that you get everything it's got to offer for eight thousand three hundred and ninety nine pounds there is no competition for this bike given what it can do given its versatility both on and off road and it's it, just huge capability for that price it has no rivals KTM's new 790 Adventure is a brilliant motorbike, but in standard trim, it's £2,700 more expensive. And in the R-Spec trim, it's £3,600 more expensive. Listen, I haven't ridden that bike. I hear it's very good, but it's got to be pretty damn good to qualify for the same sort of praise this deserves at that price. Uh, the engine is very familiar to us already. It's the 689cc parallel twin with a cross plane crank that we see in the MT-07. It's got a slightly different intake and exhaust systems and slightly different fueling. But internally at least it's just the same and it just gives good, manageable, punchy, usable power that is not intimidating to use in quantity. The suspension on the Tenere is quite trick. It's adjustable uh, at both ends. For the front, it's only adjustable for compression and rebound damping, but it's got 210 millimeters of travel from these 43 millimeter inverted forks. At the back, you've got a rising rate monoshock, fully adjustable, including a remote preload adjuster, which is very handy, and that has 200 millimetres of travel. The braking is taken care of by two 282 millimetre wavy discs on the front, gripped by Brembo two piston sliding calipers. And at the back, it's a 245 millimetre wavy disc operated by a single piston caliper. It's got switchable ABS that's been programmed to perform both on and off road. Uh, the equipment level on the Tenere 700 is a bit basic, but it's effective. Clocks tell you everything you need to know that it's not TFI. It's not flashing anywhere, but you know how much fuel's in the thing. You know how much it's using, you know what temperature is, you know what gear you're in, and it's easy to read. 
Uh, it's got a 16 litre tank. Uh, it's got hinged footrests and pedals. Uh, they are quite cleverly featuring a rubber insert to give grip during road use and then when you stand on the peg as you do when you're off-roading that collapses to allow your boots to grip the the alloy serrated part of the footrest. The tank will give a range of around 135, 150, 160 miles. It's got hand guards as standard, so that you don't need to buy those as an extra. It's got a bash plate as standard. It's pretty much ready to go off-roading. Uh, to make the standard Tenere 700 even more suitable for you, there's a range of accessories, quite a few, but they include panniers, a lower seat, a lowering link, crash bars, uh, and if you buy those, you can make the bike even more suitable for your needs. Because I enjoyed riding the 700 so much, I really can't find anything to fault it for. The only thing I'd moan about is that there weren't enough red and white ones. Oh, and right now there isn't one in my garage ready to play on. The Tenere really is a very versatile bike. It's user friendly, comfortable, has good weather protection and a decent tank range to make it agreeable on the road and lightweight and excellent suspension make it feel at home off-road too. To get a bike to perform well in such widely differing environments warrants plenty of praise. If you do need more from the bike, adding stuff from the range of accessories can make it even better. The Tenere 700 really is a great go anywhere, anytime type of bike. Arguably the very best feature about the Tenere is its price. There's simply nothing else out there to touch its dual purpose abilities for the same money. At 8,399 quid, it's a steal. Though you'll need to hurry because at the end of July when the introductory offer ends it'll go up by around 350 quid. After some great times riding for a day and a half and clocking up around 350 miles both on and off road I simply have to rate the Tenere 700 really highly. It does an excellent job off-road and that capability doesn't come with too many sacrifices to its on-road suitability. Might not be quite as plush, civilised or well equipped as some adventure bikes, but I'd rather have its true dual purpose ability for my adventure riding any day. To do what it does, as well as it does, and for the price it comes at, I'd be amazed if it doesn't sell very well. In short, it's a remarkable bike. It may be a more rugged take on that classic Ducati DNA, but the Multistrada still exudes that unmistakable Borgo Panigale spirit, with its punchy engine and balanced handling. I'll pick for longer, high-speed adventuring. Ducati's Multistrada is a wolf in sheep's clothing, packing the performance of a sports bike into the comfortable clothes of a Tourer. Debuting in 2010, the third generation is now upon us, and at first glance, not much seems to have changed. But let's be deceiving, and Ducati has actually packed a fair few changes into the 2018 Multistrada, starting with the XDR's 1262cc Tesla Strata DVT powertrain. That's right, this is a new Multistrada 1260, and with this engine upgrade comes a new of rideability. Due to end of dealerships from next month, it will be available in four spec levels of the 1260, 1260S, 1260SDA, and the Sporty Range Shop in 1260 Pikes Peak. All models will benefit from a host of new tech, including Ducati's quick shifter, keyless ignition and revised TFT dash. Boasting a longer stroke than the previous unit, new engine mapping and a fruity twin alley exhaust, this 158 horsepower powertrain, that's 6 horsepower more than the Multistrada 1200, is really well suited to the new Multi. 
Known for its rideability, it provides linear power from around 2,000 revs and plentiful torque, which is available much lower down the revs than the previous unit. There's a claimed 85% available from 3,500 RPM, which is most definitely noticeable. Ducati promises also an 18% torque hike over the 1,200 at 5,500 revs, with a peak of 95.1 pound per foot achieved at 7,500. These factors combine to make the bike much more usable than its predecessor, especially in the low to mid range, which is where you find yourself often in towns or traffic. Torque builds more steadily than the previous unit, making for more pleasant acceleration throughout the gears. But this increased low end torque doesn't mean a compromise in top end tug. The Multistrada retains its lofty power, aggressive acceleration and high speed thrills. The four riding modes of Sport, Touring, Urban and Enduro have their own mapping different degrees of engine braking. Touring is noticeably less urgent than Sport and Urban even more so, but our ride didn't actually call for Enduro. Shifting has been made a lot easier thanks to Ducati's quick shift system, which is derived from the Mark Superbikes. Providing you other row revs, it makes for relatively smooth shifting. However, it's no soft touch and does require a decent toe tap to change. On a number of occasions, I found myself in no man's land hitting false neutrals between gears after too gentle a movement. Equally, this quick shifter makes finding neutrals slightly more difficult, and during the test, I'd often find myself jumping between first and second a number of times before getting there. The old Multistrada was pretty competent when it came to handling, although top end wobble was apparently an issue, especially under load. Ducati claims to have improved this high speed stability thanks to a 48mm longer swing arm, 5mm longer trail and 1 degree increased brake, which makes for a chassis 56mm longer than the outgoing model. Our test route didn't really give us much opportunity to put this high speed stability to the test, but the bike does feel steady and balanced at motorway speeds. However, these changes don't compromise Multistrada's agility. It's very manoeuvrable both at speed and at a standstill and has an impressive turning circle. There are three seat heights to choose from, standard, standard in the lower setting and the low seat option which takes it to 805mm. But this really isn't a bike for shorter riders and at 5'7 on the low option I was still far off putting my feet flat on the floor. With wide bars and upright riding position the Multistrada is comfortable but with the lower seat fitted my arms ached a bit and the ergonomics felt slightly off. In bends I found myself leaning into the wide bars. The Multistrada may not be a sports bike but you sure can ride it like one. The 1260S gets Ducati's semi-active Skyhook suspension with a 48mm electronic sax Evo fork and electronic sax DSS Evo shock which proves firm and sporty yet not bone shaking over bumps. Personally I set it to ride a plus panniers to increase the preload but there's plenty of options to choose from. The suspension dampening automatically stiffens or softens depending on a number of factors including mode, speed and lean angle. With so many levels of suspension adjustment there really is something to suit every terrain and riding style. The standard 1260 and Pikes Peak versions share mechanically adjustable Olin suspension, the latter for weight saving purposes and the former for cost reasons. Brembo brakes feature across the Multistrada range in the form of M Ford 32 radial monoblock calipers with 320mm discs on the standard model and sharp M50 radial monoblock calipers with 330 discs in the S, SDR and Pikes Peak. There's also cornering ABS, traction control, wheelie control and vehicle hold control, all of which are for the most part intuitive and unobtrusive. Annoyingly though, the vehicle hold control actually only stays on for 10 seconds before deactivating and letting the bike roll backwards and considering most traffic lights stay red for more than 10 seconds, this isn't ideal. So to the untrained eye, the new Multistrada differs very little from its predecessor. However, there's a couple of subtle changes that really set the two apart. There's a metal tester stretcher DVT panel on the cam covers, a new grab rail which is inherited from the Multistrada Enduro, and if you're really hot on your details, you'll see that there's redesigned cheap panels. In the cockpit there's a few more changes, an updated TFT dash which is standard on the £17,395 S model and up. On this dash and using the more intuitive handlebar buttons, the rider can switch between the riding modes, preload settings and delve into more complicated suspension adjustments. And while it looks no different, the 1260 is packed with additional kit over the previous model. There's a new tyre pressure monitoring system and keyless ignition across the range. One neat aspect of which is the recovery unlock system, which in the event of lost keys allows the rider to enter a four-digit code to start the bike. 
An LED headlight with cornering lights is also standard on the S SDR and Pikes Peak. And if you feel like you haven't spent enough already, there's always the options of four accessory packages, which can be chopped and changed the rider chooses. For the Multistrada's price, you'd think that Ducati would make the screen adjustment electronic. The Triumph Tigers had one since 2012, after all. That said, there's nothing wrong with manual unit. Nothing says aggressive more than Volcano Grey paintwork, which is easily my favourite of all the Multistrada colours. The quick shift could do with some refinement, however, to avoid false neutrals, and the bike could be made a little more accessible for smaller riders. An iconic name and a pioneer of the adventure biking markets, the current generation Honda Africa Twin may be a bit long in the tooth compared to its rivals, but it's just asserts its authority as the granddaddy of the market and has been honed over decades of experience. Hello, as you can see, I've been riding Honda's long-awaited Africa Twin at the launch in South Africa. Now, since the Spectre announced, some readers have dismissed it as too heavy and bulky to be capable off-road. But it doesn't seem that big when you see it. It may weigh about the same as a base model R1200 GS at 232kg fuel to the BMW's 230, but it feels more like sitting on a G650 GS. At 5'9", I'm usually on tiptoes on a big adventure bike, but on this, I could almost get both feet flat on the ground. The seat was 870mm and it's adjustable to 850 and there are optional tall and low seats that take those figures up or down by 30mm. It feels narrow, something that's allowed by the parallel twin engine configuration where the original Africa twins were V-twins. At 94 horsepower, it's no KTM super adventure, it's not super fast, but the power is super accessible thanks to a broad and linear delivery across the range. Now Honda didn't seem very happy about me saying this in my written review, but it reminded me of the predictable delivery of the NC750 range, albeit with 42 more horses and a higher red line at about 8,000 instead of 6,000. It's significant that it makes 94 horsepower because it means it should be possible to restrict it for A2 license holders. In the first part of the launch ride on twisty tarmac, it was tractable enough to stay in a high gear through bends and then accelerate fairly hard to the next one without changing. At one point, the Dunlop Trailmax dual sport tyres momentarily threatened to lose traction. I think at both ends were probably led by the 21 inch front. It was one of those moments that makes you lift the bike up a bit and think, did it just do that? The front brake, which is the same as the CRF 450 rallies using radial four-pot Nissan calipers, is sharp, but the front tyres sometimes struggle for grip under hard braking too. ABS comes as standard along with three level traction control and both can be deactivated, the ABS at the rear wheel only. It's really straightforward, one button changes the traction control level and you can do it on the fly without closing the throttle, hold it for three seconds and traction control is off. There's also a DCT version of the Africa Twin using Honda's automatic dual clutch transmission, the same system that's available on the NC750 range and VFR 1200. The latest generation of DCT has three sport modes and one drive mode. It's still not quite perfect. The highest sport mode held onto low gears for too long for me, shut off and the engine braking provided by mid-range is denied because you're still at the top end of the range. The middle or lower S mode seemed better but sometimes still chose the wrong gear. Overtaking I'd open the throttle wide and it would immediately shift down to give me the drive I requested and then after overtaking I might back off but it would still hold onto the low gear. So I finished the road ride unsure of the benefit of DCT on the Africa Twin, but I changed my mind after going off-road on day two of the launch. Honda had said the DCT system could detect when the bike was going up or downhill and choose the right gear. I couldn't quite believe it would, but it did. In the least aggressive of the three sport modes, on an uphill gradient, the system made the necessary shifts to keep me in drive and momentum. I only felt the need to shift myself once or twice for a bit more acceleration approaching a steeper section. When you do want to make a gear selection, the button shifters on the left bar make it improbably easy. The upshift button is on the front of the bar and the downshift button is on the back, so your thumb and forefinger fall on them naturally when you're standing on the pegs. It would be great for the less experienced off-road. On sandy trails, level 1 traction control let the rear drift a bit and again I let the DCT do most of the gear changes. With less attention occupied by gear selection, there's more free to focus on other demands like staying on the gas as the front and back wheels take different routes through deep sand. Because DCT is designed to make gear shifts as seamless as possible, there's also a G mode which makes them more abrupt to provide more instant traction on dirt. Press a button on the dash with a G on it and it's on. I found the manual version confidence inspiring and easy for a big bike off-road too. The narrow profile gives you space to move around to shift your weight forward while standing on the pegs. As I said earlier, it feels more like a middleweight than a really big adventure bike. But 94 horsepower is not middleweight power. Rapid acceleration is only ever a few RPM away. 
does have the capacity of a big adventure bike to limit the impression of, of speed off-road. The smoothness of the engine, the weight of the machine and the competence of the suspension mean you can find yourself at 60 miles an hour before you know it. Honda called the concept version a true adventure prototype. I'm going to call this production version a real adventure bike. A 232 kilogram machine that really can go anywhere, on tarmac, with luggage and opinion, or on dusty South African trails. A big bike that's actually useful off-road, and not just in the hands of an advanced off-road rider, but for the more ordinary of us as well. At 10,499 or 11,299 with DCT, it's competitively priced too. The R1200 GS starts at 12,100. Attractive, practical, well equipped and good value, the Kawasaki Versus 1000 may be more of a Tora adventure hybrid, but it's a jack of all trades approach that makes it the most versatile all rounder on the market today. Welcome to Lanzarote, uh, we're here in the marvellous sunshine next to the lovely lava strewn beach. And uh, we're here for a couple of days riding the new 2019 Kawasaki Versus 1000, which is what this is. What's not miniature is this bike. It's a quite, it's a big, big thing. This is the, the Grand Tourer SE version. And uh, it's completely loaded with all sorts of good stuff. We've got hard luggage, cornering lights, IMU traction control, cornering ABS. Uh, Kawasaki, they've kind of taken all the, the, the sort of high-end stuff that they've used on the, the H2SX, uh, SE, and then they kind of transplanted it onto the, the Versus 1000. Uh, the, the base bike hasn't changed that much, I mean, uh, the, the engine's pretty much as, as you wear, uh, as is the frame. Uh, the brakes are upgra update, upgraded, and uh, we've got electronic suspension on this SE version. of really good riding actually it's, it's a lovely environment in which to test a bike here you know there's some great roads uh, around Lanzarote and Fuerteventura I uh, had the biggest ride on Fuerteventura uh, yesterday afternoon and you know just you know amazing and uh, quite a good bike to do it on it, it's not a performance bike it's, it's very much a touring machine you know so you, you don't expect too much but it, it does impress you you know the, the brakes are strong the new brakes are strong uh, Bridgestone tyres, T31s are good, pl plenty of grip you know, in these warm, dry conditions. And uh, the engine, I felt the engine could do a little bit more sort of top end, you know, really smooth, really nice low down, but just when, you're, when you sort of pick up the speed and move up towards 100 miles an hour plus, I think, you know, it's, it's lacking a bit of power. I think it's 118 peak power horsepower uh, is the figure in, in comparison with something like the, the BMW S XR or even the Ducati Multistrada. It's a bit down on power and, uh, and it's not very light either. Uh, very comfortable to ride, you've got the adjustable screen there, you can put it up and down to sort of suit, suit yourself what you're looking for. And uh, the riding position was, was good for me, you know, both feet flat on the ground quite, quite easily. Uh, and I'm quite stumpy so that's good, so don't think it's one of those big sort of adventure Overall, but Versus 1000 in this form, the SE Grand Tour, very impressive. You know, if you want something to put, put your significant other on, load up with luggage and uh, ride to Fuerteventura maybe, uh, you, could do, you could really do a lot worse than, than pick one of these. Dealer. They're in the shops now, get down your Kawasaki dealer, take one for a spin and uh, see what you think. <laughs>